Hello friends and family and welcome to the global pandemic crippling anxiety meditation hour that lasts 10 minutes and welcome to my new home. We have successfully moved to Jammu and into an apartment where we will be staying for the foreseeable future, um, at least until borders open up again. I wanted to discuss today the topic of distraction and um, in particular a quote which appears in a lot of ancient literature in various forms, but uh, in particular uh, it shows up in the Tao Te Ching, which I mentioned recently. And the, the quote takes the shape when translated into English of the five colors blind the eye, the five flavors dull the taste. And initially, when I first came across this quote, it did seem incredibly mystical. Um, and I could draw um, gross world parallels, but I couldn't really come up with an explanation of what was being said. Not exactly. And it wasn't until my first uh, 10-day meditation course that I actually really understood what this meant. Um, and it's a commentary on distractions, sensory distractions. Um, the quote goes on to uh, enumerate all of the sense doors, um, not just the, the eyes and the mouth, but um, the point that's being drawn out is that we look to satisfy not only cravings for things um, and for experiences, but we tend to have this desire to look for distractions away from whatever is actually happening. I think that's probably very true right now. So many of us are in an uncomfortable position. Um, there is a lot of legitimate anxiety that people are feeling. <laughs> There's a fly in here. Um, and that anxiety can cause us to look for something else, anything else that can draw our attention away from the current I don't know what would make a fly want to spend its time on my face. <laughs> I'm going to leave this in the video. Um, so we seek out other things. We, we look to read, we look to watch TV, we look to um, indulge ourselves in some other activity which can take us away from this obsessing about the virus, about the current state of global politics, the fact that many of our countries seem to have limited leadership um, capable of dealing with these situations. And it is difficult because this situation is surfacing other issues. So we're in India right now, and the difference between our journey across the borders as financially comfortable, privileged 
members of society compared to the border crossing process for migrant workers coming from one state to another state back to their home state, back to their uh, home cities and villages, um, is stark. And there are similar situations um, surfacing around the world in different countries. <clears throat> and it's causing us to think about the the state of the world and how we treat other people and we have limited agency at the best of times but that agency is particularly limited at present we can't do much we can donate money we can uh, join campaigns we can support others with our voice across the internet but physically um, we're sort of hamstrung as a species not just as individuals um, un until the situation um, improves and this can be incredibly frustrating for people because we find ourselves more than ever wanting to help, wanting to improve the situation, and we can't. And so as an alternative to feeling trapped, we end up turning away and looking towards something that might make us feel better. And um, this situation has existed on the internet in particular for quite a few years, um, where we often find ourselves inundated with either terrible news or puppy photos. And there isn't really much else. Um, and this desire for distraction is, it's not something new. It's not something that was born with the iPhone or born with the internet. Um, ever since human beings have had the capacity to feel helpless to feel sad <laughs> to feel um, fundamentally depressed about something there has always been this corollary which is that um, there's an impulse to distract ourselves and those distractions wherever they're coming from are sensory distractions um, if they're on the internet they're mostly audiovisual but uh, we can distract ourselves with food. We can distract ourselves with um, a comfortable bed. And what this amounts to is a, an escalation, an overwhelming of the senses where we feel we need to pursue more and more in terms of experience. And particularly in affluent cultures, you see this um, more than elsewhere, I think, where people end up pursuing more adventure and more flavors that literally, in the literal sense, where we need to eat every culture's food and we do need to experience every kind of spice and every kind of meat and <laughs> and we find ourselves satisfied less and less and 
this experience of needing newer and newer things to satisfy ourselves, to satisfy our sense of distraction, um, it comes at the expense of pleasure. <sighs> Sorry. In the things that we know to be good. So we may know that we enjoy a certain cake. <laughs> we may know that we enjoy dosas. We may know that we enjoy a certain song. And after so many times of hearing that song, it, it loses its color, it loses its flavor. Um, it loses the characteristics we used to enjoy about it. But the fact of the matter is, is that those things are still there. It's us that's changing. It's us that is getting bored with um, the various distractions uh, that we have. And we're looking for new distractions, distractions on distractions. And it is through the practice of meditation only that I've ever seen a lasting effect, and I mean, it doesn't last forever, but a lasting effect of uh, recapturing this small sense of wonder um, where a person can enjoy a strawberry or enjoy a song um, in a way that we may have when we were children. And I think that, that this is a common understanding, that the bend of time away from the almost magical sense of the world in childhood, where everything is new, even if it's not. If you remember being a child, you would do the same things over and over and over, and they would tend to maintain uh, a real significance for you, or at least they did for me. I, I would find um, countless hours of entertainment in some fairly banal subject matter and that sense of wonder is sort of understood um, within the scope of common sense to be uh, a characteristic which naturally dies off with age. So as we get older and we enter into our 20s and 30s, um, we lose this sense that the natural world has real majesty about it. And although I'm not quite 40 yet or 50 or 60 yet, um, it's natural, it seems, for people of those ages to become more and more disgruntled and frustrated with a world that is no longer satisfying. And so we look, we look to other distractions, larger distractions, um, the things we own, the cruises we can go on, the vacations we can take, the money and power that we can accumulate, the influence that we might have, the fame that we might gain. And it continues and continues to wear away at anything that we found previously enjoyable. And the reason that this is relevant to meditation is
the practice of meditation, focused meditation, is it can be seen in one of two ways, really. From where we're standing now, sitting, <laughs> we, we see our whole body, we feel our whole body, we see and comprehend the room around us, the space around us, the world around us, and it feels as though we are an individual in some space. And that makes sense from a common perspective um, because this is how we see ourselves. Oh, I am an individual. I am Stephen Diabold, this one person. And on the surface, that, that is what I am. I'm a blob of meat, really, but I am one person. Um, I am one mind and one body stumbling through the world together. Um, the other way to view this is not as though what we're experiencing is some sort of inherently objective reality that I am one person sitting in a room. <clears throat> the other way is to look at our perception and say, oh, okay, right now my perception is of one person sitting in a room. And that this perception can, it can be altered. Um, and so time is one important aspect, and we've talked about that before, but space is really notable in terms of how significant a thing is. And if we can reduce the amount of space that our attention is covering, rather than this whole room and out the window and my entire body, if I reduce my attention to just this space, that's much smaller. And from the perspective of my perception, my awareness, if this becomes my whole reality, then the rest of this goes away. The room is no longer there, the window is no longer there, the rest of my body is no longer there. <clears throat> and this isn't necessarily an easy thing to do, of course, but um, it is a natural consequence of continuity in meditation. So how many breaths am I paying attention to, really, fully attentive to? So I'm, I'm breathing in, and I'm paying attention, and I'm breathing out, and I'm paying attention, and then I'm breathing in, and halfway through, my attention has gone somewhere. Well, okay, we'll call that one and a half, three, two and a, two and a half, <laughs> if you're generous. Um, and this continuity from one minute to five minutes to 10 minutes to an entire hour, the longer we have continuity over this one object of meditation, this one continuously changing object of meditation in a very narrow space, the, the further away from all these other things we get. And all these other things obviously include the room and the rest of my body and um, the things that I'm hearing, the immediate. Um, but all of these things are, are real for some value of real. They're right here. Um, so getting away from them, it sometimes takes longer. But 
there is a lot of imaginary stuff weighing on us while we're trying to meditate and it's often what is distracting us these imaginary things are the virus right the virus is very real but our idea of the virus is very much a product of our imagination you're not experiencing the virus right now i'm not experiencing the virus right now we can't know the virus experientially until we have it even to watch a friend or a loved one fighting with the virus is not really to know the virus that's more real certainly but for most of us our perception of the situation is largely in our imaginations and again as we maintain continuity over the object of meditation that is stripped away it is removed from our attention even just for a second if it's for one breath it's for one breath but that's one less breath in the day that our mind is obsessing over this idea uh, over this imagination this concept is therefore twofold one we are drawing ourselves as i said before outside in away from imagination away from abstract emotional states away from our ideas and toward just the body and further toward a very narrow component of the body and with further continuity we stay breathing in breathing out breathing in breathing out for longer stretches this narrow area actually feels like it's being enlarged so right now it feels like the space around me is this room the space around me is this desk the space around me is the clothes i'm wearing and the way they feel on my body but that's just some context right that's just some box i've said well this is the space around me i'm not particularly aware of the rest of the building um it's around me but i don't feel like it's immediately around me and so the context is the room but as we extend the amount of focus we have on this area it's as if that area expands to fill the room and at some point um we're we're examining that small area this small area as though it were the size of a room oh okay and now i can i can walk around that small area i can i can examine it in smaller and smaller increments and i mean it doesn't happen overnight um we don't jump from being aware of ourselves as an individual to oh this tiny space is ballooned up into the size of a house but it does happen and it it happens incrementally this thing grows and the distractions get pushed away and what you end up seeing inside are the the tiny increments these tiny tiny increments of reality where the breath is is a touching the skin the insides of the nostrils wherever it's touching and the flow of the breath and the time it takes for the breath to actually occur and we start feeling smaller and smaller things within that space and what's interesting about that 
is it's essentially an exercise for seeing small things. And unconsciously, we get better at doing that. So then when I stop meditating, I open my eyes, I go to the kitchen and I get a strawberry. I notice the flavors of the strawberry more acutely. And this is what is meant by, in that specific instance, the five flavors dull the taste. If I'm chasing after delicious and overwhelming flavors, that becomes the only thing that I can feel. And so I pursue heavier and stronger and more potent flavors and smells and sensation and everything else. And it is in this way that meditation brings our attention back to something small, something narrow, such that we can magnify it. Not intentionally. It's not that I sit there and I go to bite into a strawberry and I think, oh, okay, let me magnify the flavor of this strawberry. It's not, it's not something that you can do. Um, but it is something that your body and mind are capable of, not necessarily consciously. We're just going to have to have this whole video be the video of interruptions. Um, so it's an, it's an interesting consequence that the distractions which we are heading toward under these circumstances are going to be less and less satisfying as we pursue them. And in the same way that it is true that there are many issues which have existed for a long period of time, such as the migrant worker population in India being I would say uncomfortably underserved by the rest of society, that that is magnified um, by the pandemic, that there are other situations um, that are magnified by the pandemic and these will be our personal situations and we will find as usual uh, that these distractions satisfy us less and less the more we pursue them but now we're in this position of having this microcosm around us of okay now there's there's almost nothing else right if i find music i used to find satisfying used to find distracting no longer does those things it doesn't satisfy me it doesn't distract me i can't go out to a movie theater i can't go out to a restaurant um to satisfy my desire for distraction in some other way and if there isn't a distraction at home that meets the need it can really bear down on me and this is a value of uh, anapana meditation in particular that it's not the goal of anapana meditation um, 
but it is a nice side effect that it will draw out these positive qualities about things that we experience in such a way that we begin to enjoy them uh, perhaps even more than we did in the first place. Um, that's a long lecture for today. <laughs> I apologize, that wasn't my intention. But um, we can take 10 minutes and uh, have uh, a period of meditation together. If you have your timer, you can start your own timer along with this one. So you have a backup. And we will start the timer now.
that's our timer for today. And um, I, I'm again suffixing the video with a disclaimer rather than putting the caveat up front of, come on fly, I'm trying to make a video here. <laughs> Uh, that this is not meditation instruction. It is just a discussion about um, the practice of meditation and the effects of meditation. I hope everyone is staying safe and we will see you all tomorrow. Goodbye.